Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Seth Padukin. I'm the director of the graduate program in science writing. Um, and it is my absolute pleasure and honor to invite you all to the class of 2018's thesis presentations. Uh, the theses are the cornerstone of the program. Um, what you are going to see today is the result of a full academic year's worth of work. Uh, and every year, um, all of the faculty and instructors in the program are delighted and amazed and surprised by what the students are able to produce. Uh, and this year is absolutely no different. You all are in for a real treat. Um, just a little bit on the logistics of the day. Uh, each student is going to give a presentation for 15 to 20 minutes. Um, then we will open it up to questions. Even if your voice carries, uh, try to grab this mic for the questions, uh, which I will put on the back, um, one of the back tables, because this is also being live streamed for people who can't make it. Um, and if your voice is not coming through here, then it will not come through the live stream at all. Uh, we also, after, um, we're going to have four presentations in the morning, we will break for lunch, have another three, and then the end of the day um, is uh, always one of my favorite parts, the presentation of the students' documentary films, which they've been working on um, with Tom Levinson, another professor in the program, for the last semester. Uh, so uh, please stick around all day. Uh, without further ado, um, our first presenter today is Fatima Hussain. And take it away. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. As Ethel said, I'm Fatima Hussein, and I'm really excited to talk with you all today about my master's thesis, The Deepest Paradox Before Mining in Its Future. But before I get into the details about my thesis, I'd like to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from and why I chose this topic. So I'd like to say that I grew up in the dirt in Iowa, gardening, and surrounded by little plants. And I think my peers can attest to the fact that I'm still surrounded by plants today. I'm growing a little, little something in the lab. <laughs> um, but that interest really grew into an interest in environmental science and geology, which is what I ultimately studied for my undergraduate. And studying that required me to move out of the cornfields and flatlands of Iowa all the way to the East Coast, where I was exposed to a whole new set of environmental features mountains, rivers, coastlines, it was amazing. But the feature that really stood out to me the most, the one that we know about the least, is our oceans. And I told myself, when I finally felt comfortable enough calling myself a writer, I'd write about the ocean. So what better opportunity to explore that setting than in my master's thesis? So that's what led me to our oceans. So, I'd like to begin by reading just a little bit from my thesis to prime us for the statement. Thousands of meters below the ocean surface lie rich metallic treasures, carefully distributed along the seafloor by a delicate combination of ocean chemistry, physics, and biology. And for these treasures, the wars of the deep are about to begin. The battlegrounds are only partially understood humankind will venture to remote, unexplored territory that can be described no more precisely than as the bottom of the sea. Other planets of the solar system, including Venus and Mars, are better mapped than Earth's own seafloor. As a result, much of the seafloor remains essentially invisible and unimaginable. Accurate and detailed maps of Earth's depths, used and created by prospectors and scientists alike, are perhaps as rare as the desired treasures the innovations of tomorrow may be supported by metals mined at depth. Mines aren't renewable resources. Once the metals are taken, they're essentially gone forever. As the amount of metal remaining in mines on land dwindles, it's becoming harder, potentially more dangerous, and less economically feasible to extract them. Some argue that seafloor mining, which isn't sustainable and may irreversibly damage seafloor environments, must take place to support efficient and sustainable technology development on land. A paradox. But in the end, most scientists and miners alike agree that, the seafloor, that mining the seafloor is inevitable. It's no longer a question of if the seafloor will be mined. It's a battle over how and when. 
So when we're imagining the sea floor, this might be the first image that comes to mind. But we're going to go somewhere a little deeper. This is far too shallow. You can see life. You can see these beautiful coral reefs. I would love to snorkel here and look at the life beneath me. But we're going to go somewhere even, even deeper. So deep, in fact, that you can't see anything. Light doesn't permeate at that depth. We're talking kilometers beneath the surface. And I'd like to take you on a journey with me through the oceans. Let's explore these geological formations that we mined together. And let me begin by telling you a little bit about where we're going. Because the oceans are about 70% of Earth's surface. So if we could talk about a lot. We're going to talk about a small portion today. We're going to talk about the geological formations contained in these two red rectangles. I'll start by introducing the one on the left, the box between North America and Hawaii. This box contains two regions called the Clarion Fiberton Zone and the Prime Crust Zone. These zones are very rich in metal and contain deposits that vastly outrun the ones we have on land today. We're also going to go to Australia, a little above it actually, Papua New Guinea. And out on the coast, we're going to go to a very different kind of geological formation, one that's set to be mined much, much sooner. So let's start there. And as we're getting there on our journey together, I want to talk a little bit about geology and how we approach geology. That's very important to this thesis. When you study geology formally, you don't only study it in the classroom or out of a textbook. You actually go on field trips. You get to walk along these environments. And sometimes that ability to walk and immerse yourself in that environment tells you a lot more about it. So we're going to walk through these environments together. We're going to walk on the sea floor. Now we've arrived at Papua New Guinea, and we will hit our first geological formation. On the screen is a picture of a sea floor massive sulfide deposit. These deposits form from hydrothermal vent systems. The systems where hot, rich, acidic, chemical-rich water violently escapes Earth and comes in contact with cool, oceanic bottom waters. When those hot waters come in contact with the cold, a series of very unique chemical reactions occur that cause metals and, and, metals and minerals to build up in these meters-long chimneys. And these chimneys are enriched in metals that you and I know very well like copper that's used in our electrical wiring, zinc, we have it in our multivitamins, and gold, we adorn ourselves with it. There's clearly a lot of value here. Part of what makes these deposits so amazing is how quickly they form. Hydrothermal events are some of the most active environments in our oceans today. Uh, you can look up videos of black smokers and chimneys, and it's really quite amazing, and they lead to this. These take thousands of years to form. That's quite a while shorter than the next formation we're going to hit. This one's a little bumpy on our feet. Let's go to something that's smoother. These are manganese crusts. We're now in the Pacific. These are pavements of metal ore that are deposited over millions of years. Some of these crusts have a growth rate of one millimeter per million years. The formation of these is one of the slowest geological processes on this planet. And these crusts are enriched in manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and rare earth metals, a lot of the metals that we use in technology and electronics. And a very similar geological process forms the next environment we're going to step into. And these are manganese nodules. These are located in the same place. Again, they contain very, very similarly the metals from the crust. And they form you know, entire fields of these fist-sized nodules on the ocean floor. But you know, looking at this, I can't quite imagine what it would be like to walk on this. You know, <coughs> walking on a sea floor massive sulfide seems a little bumpy and difficult. Walking on a crust seems very calm and, and nice under my feet. But I don't know, does this feel like cobblestone? I'm not quite sure. So I brought out a little surprise for you all today. Um, I actually have one of these nodules that has grown over millions of years from the bottom of the ocean. And if you want to take a closer look, 
you're welcome to, to stop me after the lecture and, and get a feel for it. But these are very bumpy. This is only a quarter of a nodule. They form in circles and they stick up from the ocean floor. They're quite unique. So I've mentioned these deposits to you. We've walked through these environments. We've felt them under our feet. And I've mentioned and hinted about how the metals in them could be used in technology. But I want to give you some concrete examples of what that would really look like. You know, why is this important? This is the ad for the iPhone X, you know, the newest of the new. Say hello to the future. To get such brilliant technologies that have long battery lives and vivid colors on the screen, we need special rare earth metals and special metals for technology that are contained at depth. But, I mean, I didn't grow up with this technology. I could live without it. You know, this is a necessity for life today. So that's why I want to take you to another location that kind of demonstrates how important these metals are. This is a photograph of the Block Island Wind Farm located off the coast of Rhode Island. Uh, the GPSW students had the ability to go and visit this wind farm and get a tour at the beginning of the year. And these things are massive. They dwarf everything next to them. And we took a little boat out uh, while we were there and got to see these and take a lot of great pictures. But one thing that happened while we were on the boat was a, an engineer from GE, General Electric, the company that builds these turbines, he began to talk to us about how these turbines are different from the ones that we see on land. And there's something quite different. You can't go out and repair these if something breaks. So they had to create wind turbines that will last longer, less prone to failure. And they did that by removing a component of the wind turbine called a gearbox. And what a gearbox does is it modulates the different speeds between different moving parts of a turbine. It's a really important factor in the turbine's operation. So if you remove it, you have to replace it with something else. I think they're going to rapidly fail. So what can we replace them with? Well, it turns out we can replace them with extremely strong metals, uh, metals in magnets. Metals that have the names of neodymium and dysprosium. One of these wind turbines can use 800 kilograms of these rare earth metals that most of us don't even say the names of in our lifetime. But they're necessary. This wind farm is really, really successful. They're generating a lot of power for Block Island. People's livelihoods rely off of the power that's generated by these. So to get a sense for what more of that looks like, I spoke to two experts on the subject. The first is Dr. Jim Hine from the United States Geological Survey. He's a geologist and he's been studying crusts, uh, nodules, and uh, sea floor massive sulfide deposits for over 40 years. He's dedicated his career to them and is the world expert on this. And he told me in our conversations that this mining is inevitable, and it has to be done to support sustainable energy development on land. To confirm that and to see what's really the scope of the use of these metals, I spoke to Dr. Alex King, and he works out of the Ames Lab at the Critical Materials Institute. And that institute is run by the Department of Energy. What they do is they study how available the metals are that are used in industry around the world. And he told me about a rare earth metal crisis that industry faced in the early 2010s when China cut off the exports of rare earth metals mined on land. That sent the industry into a panic. So having the security of knowing there's a rich deposit somewhere else, the seafloor, could be quite valuable. And he told me that if the seafloor were to be mined, it would be used for those developments. So all seems good and well. We know where these deposits are. We know that they're enriched. We've studied them for years from the geological standpoint. So what's the catch? What don't we know? Everything sounds amazing. They'll supplement what we have on land. It'll solve all of our problems. But as we all know, there's always more than one side to a story. And the other side to this story is the biology standpoint. So to get a sense of that standpoint, I spoke to four deep sea biologists. And I've shown them in action here. The first biologist I spoke to was Dr. Christopher Kelly. He's from the University of Hawaii and is the program biologist for the Hawaii Undersea Research Laboratories. And he's been studying life at depth for most of his career as well. And in our conversations, he told me about how there was amazing 
corals, giant corals growing on crusts, that there was life at nodules, that there were species that people had never even discovered before. And those sentiments were echoed, echoed by his colleague, Dr. Diva Aman. She's a biologist from Trinidad, and she's dedicated her life study to this life at depth as well, and wants to do everything she can to protect it as, as a biologist. She mentioned to me that crusts and nodules, when mined, will inevitably lead to a massive loss of life of the organisms that live on them. A lot of these organisms can't move out of the way when the mining machinery comes. They're going to be literally crushed to death and some suffocated. To learn about the life at another set of deposits of cyclomassive sulfides that's been changed from the beginning, I talked to Dr. Drina Tinnicliff from the University of Victoria in Canada. And she could not emphasize enough how many new species there are there. She even went so far as to say that if we mined cyclomassive sulfide deposits and didn't protect the life in them, we would inevitably lose species, entire species, gone. Some of them only exist in one system. To study the environmental impacts, because right now they're all predicted, estimated. Some of them just make sense logically. If, if a starfish can't move, it'll be crushed when something comes to, to collect the rock on it, uh, underneath it. A lot of what we know about these impacts comes from modeling as well. And Dr. Malcolm Clark, uh, a program biologist uh, from New Zealand, is actually on a cruise right now, as we sit here on this room, to study in real life what happens when you intentionally perturb an environment. And he's going to study those perturbations to understand what the real learning impacts are using the advanced technologies we have today. They want a, to paint a really clear picture of the life we have at depth and what's at stake if we mine here. So I've included some pictures of this life, and, and Dr. D. Valmone said it really well. She said, the life down there is pretty similar to the life at the surface, the life that you and I see, but down there it just looks a bit weirder. We have these really interesting stringy corals. We have a really interesting bright red guy up there. And we have this really cool little octopus that just recently got discovered in the past two years. It's affectionately nicknamed Casper. I wonder if you can tell why. <laughs> these are the lives that are at risk. These are lives we're just discovering. We don't know what role they play in their communities. We don't know how they control the deep sea. But they've evolved over millions and millions of years on these environments, on these formations. And what the biologists want to do is to get the word out about them, so that we understand that this mining isn't all good and well, the same way it wasn't on land. But I've spoken so much about this mining, let me tell you a little bit about what it's going to look like. And to learn about that, I reached out to Nautilus Minerals. So Nautilus Minerals is a Canadian company based out of Brisbane, Australia. And what they plan to do is they plan to mine the C4 massive sulfide deposits I introduced to you in the very beginning later next year. That's really soon. That might be too soon for a biologist to tell what's really down there. And how are they going to do it? They're going to use a machine that looks like that, actually multiple. And if you can see, there's actually a man for scale in there, these are massive, they dwarf us. And what's going to happen is these instruments, these heavy machines are going to be lifted and, and floated out onto sea onto giant boats, suspended beneath the water and connected to these boats by tubes. Once they get to the bottom, they're going to start to grind up these formations and suck them up. And while these formations and rocks are being sucked up these tubes, all the water that's extra is going to be squeezed out and released back into the ocean. So, there's two things in this process that the biologists and miners alike worry about. And first, it's that grinding process for reasons I described earlier. There are simply some organisms that live in these formations that can't get out of the way. So they're going to be crushed to death. They're going to be pulled up as well. But the second process is that process of squeezing out that water. What's going to happen is that water contains a lot of toxic metals in it, metals that were previously not available to life because they were locked in these formations. They're going to be ground up and released. 
And these pools of water that contain these metals can travel far farther out than the sight line itself. And for example, they could contain copper at Solara 1, and copper is very toxic to marine life in high quantities. So I'd like to get into a little bit about the challenges I had with my thesis at this point. I think it's a, I think it's a good point. So I was really successful in getting the biologist's standpoint. I was really happy. I had a distribution of people from around the world that covers the oceans. I was very happy. I got to talk to the geologist, and he gave me a lot of great insight. I got to talk to Alex King and learn about what these metals would be used for. But getting in touch with John Perianos was the absolute hardest thing I experienced. I'm going to show you what that looked like. So, up here is the initial email I sent out. You absolutely don't have to read it, but I'll just let you know I sent out a very similar one to everyone that I reached out to for this thesis. And I was hoping, you know, once I hit send, I'll hear back within a week or two. I'll get to talk to them. I'll be ready to go. I'll have all the information I need. You know, wishful thinking. What proceeded was a dialogue that went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and it didn't stop. The last email at the very top, it goes from top to bottom, so my original is in January, and we're all the way in April at the top, but I still haven't gotten a word from them. We've set up meetings, and they've been canceled because Nautilus had a meeting and they had to travel to another country. There was earthquakes on top of New Guinea, so they couldn't talk. A lot of things complicated this discussion. So you would think that, oh, finally, you know, April 10th, that's the last email about there, and kind Noreen is already apologizing about all of this. But that's not all. This is the second set. <laughs> this is what we'll see after. But finally, I was able to get word from them and talk to John for that hour and to get that miner's perspective to tie all of this together, to tie together all of the working pieces of my pieces. So what I've done here is I've really tried to describe this competition really between the miners and the biologists uh, and what that means for life at death. There is that paradox. Does it make sense that in order to create wind turbines that could create clean energy for us for years, that we must obliterate environments of the seafloor and fauna first? Does it? I don't know. Maybe there's more we need to know. Bree Matunikluf, actually, I think, distilled it best. She said, do we really know what we're doing at the bottom of the sea? So before I conclude my talk, I'd like to thank my advisor, Marsha, for helping guide me through this really intensive process. My peers, of course, for being the best support anyone could ever ask for. My professors, who I've learned so much from. Uh, and Shannon, for her endless, endless support. <coughs> oh my goodness, I'm still going to need that support after this. Um, <laughs> but now, if, if you guys would like, I'd love to answer any questions you have.
But we're talking about Papua New Guinea with John. That's not international waters. We're talking about national waters that are governed by the Papua New Guinea government itself. But thankfully, the processes in terms of minimizing environmental damage and being transparent are the same, regardless of international and national. And Nautilus actually does something a little bit more. If you were really curious about this, you could actually find the environmental impact reports on their website right now. And they're easily searchable. They're being very transparent about the process. Um, why do you think it was so hard to get the miners' perspective? Do you think was that an effort to sort of hope that you would eventually give up, or was that just an issue of him actually being really busy? I think that they hoped I would give up, honestly, because if you saw that was strung out for months and there's so many emails in there. Um, but I wasn't going to, ever. <laughs> I was gonna get someone on the line. Um, but I will admit that there were some issues that, that plagued this company. So Nautilus is about to start this process of mining. There is no industry for this yet. They're the leaders of it. So sometimes that means they get cuts in funding, or they have to delay their timeline because of mechanical failures. So far, they're doing really well. But if you ask Nautilus, even a decade ago, they would have said, we're ready to mine in 2012. So you can see there's, there's some delays on their part. So I think they were in no rush to talk about those delays. And actually, a follow up to that. So, um, how did, as a reporting challenge, how did you deal with not feeling like you were being a huge pain in the ass when you have to send so many emails to get them to respond to you, to get them to respond to you? I suppose I didn't feel like I was being a huge pain in the ass because what Nautilus is doing is they're ripping up part of the seafloor. So I thought it was a little fair in this case to bug them a little bit to learn about what they're going to do. And I knew that this thesis would be absolutely incomplete without their perspective. Fatima, that was a, a lovely presentation. Um, I'm, uh, and I learned things that I truly didn't know before. Um, I'm curious uh, a bit about um, the potential scale of this industry. Mm -hmm. So how, you, you mentioned the two know, areas, the two rectangles uh, in the Pacific and, uh, and, well, I guess they're both in the Pacific. Um, uh, but the, uh, I guess, how much of the ocean floor is actually rich in either the nodules or these, um, you know, sort of uh, hydrothermal inspired structures? So we have very active oceans and a very active planet in the and that means that we have a lot of mid-ocean ridges, and mid-ocean ridges are accompanied by hydrothermal vents. So in the Atlantic, we have a lot of these systems as well. So there's a lot of those. They're kind of hard to find, but they're there. On the other hand, crusts are pretty much ubiquitous in our ocean. They just happen to be most enriched in that area. And they're so enriched that if mining were to start now on the crusts, it would pretty much sustain all development on land for the rest of our lifetime our children's lifetimes and our grandchildren and so on, they're really quite enriched. They're entirely untapped resources. Uh, however, I want to express very strongly that this isn't renewable. It took millions of years to grow. So though they could sustain development for our civilization for a while, they're not going to last forever, as it seems every other resource. But they are quite vast uh, and, and pretty much extended throughout the ocean. And sort of a similar question, what's the current state of, uh, sort of taking a, just a baseline biological census? How much don't we know? <gasps> so much. We don't know the majority. I would say that, um, you know, there's a, there's a quote in like, I think just regular biology says that like we only understand like 1% of life or something. There's a lot of rich microbial life that I didn't mention in my talk. But there's microbial life living in these features as well. Uh, Christopher Kelly actually said that he thinks that you know the cure to cancer could be found in these organisms at depth because they've evolved to live in such like, harsh conditions. Maybe they'll stand up. So we don't know, and for that reason, there's also a lot of potential. Yeah. 
and that's that's itself very dangerous. But as as of yet, I think the biologists would agree that we don't know nearly anything. Bob, um, um, can you give us a sense of of how much of the of the negative environmental impact? How much has that been written about and talked about uh, at this point in time? Sure, well, that's a really good question because it highlights a timing problem. We've known about these formations for a long time and have known that we could potentially mine them, but the serious talks haven't started until now. And the studies that we're using to examine the negative ecological impacts and the environmental impacts are from the 70s. So we're using a lot of outdated information. We don't really know enough, again, some of them we can piece together just understanding the process by itself. Um, but that's where you know Malcolm Clark comes in. He's supplementing the information, bringing it into the modern age, intentionally disturbing these environments. Because there is no natural analog uh, to mining. It's a completely human activity. You can't, there's no adaptation that the life has developed to it. So studying that is quite integral. Well, um, have, have there been articles in, in major publications like the New York Times or the Guardian or the New Yorker about this, sure. about the, the environmental issues here? Yes, there are plenty about the ecological consequences. That's really the main criticism against deep sea mining in the first place. And, and you can find, if you look at deep sea mining, a lot of these articles will talk about how life at death will suffer. However, what my thesis does that they don't is go through every formation and all the life there. How does the concern about the underwater life compare to mining on land? I rarely, I mean, you occasionally hear about the environmental uh, impact uh, of uh, landmines, but they inevitably go on. They take whole mountaintops on. West Virginia, and there doesn't seem to be concern about uh, uh, the impact there. Uh, how does that compare? It, it seems there seems to be more uh, concern about the underwater life than there is on how mining is affecting the land life. What I would say is the challenge. There might be more concern about the land life right now because that's the mining that is used to support us today. That's the mining that we see photographs of. We've been able to study these environments because there's no major challenges in studying them. We can walk into them, take samples really easily, see who's there and who isn't. But at depth, it's a very different story because so much is unexplored. One thing that came up over and over in my conversations with the biologists is how a lot of species have never been seen by humans. A lot of the formations haven't ever been seen by humans before. So it's kind of an uphill battle to convince someone to care about something they won't ever see. Um, so it's, it's quite challenging, and I think a lot of science communication public outreach is being done by organizations such as the Pew Charitable Trust um, to try to inform people about those environmental consequences and, and what life that is, to kind of instill the same worry we have about the impacts of land-based mining. So they need to find uh, polar bear equivalent underwater. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think that Casper there would be a really good candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and as get ready for our next presentation, uh, Frankie Shembri. Um, this is a special delight for me uh, because Frankie also was an undergraduate science writing major at MIT, so this is actually the set, the second, I was about to say the seventh thesis presentation of Frankie's, the second thesis, <laughs> thesis like presentation uh, of hers um, that I would get to see, uh, and her work is on the uh, promise, perils, and pitfalls of personalized education. Uh, in the end, Jack Kira. Let's give her a second to get set up.
there's lots more breakfast. So if people want to take this time to go snack up. Yeah, please go snack up. I'll, uh, I'll gather myself here. <coughs> um, yeah, wow. What, a, what an eloquent presentation from Fatima. Um, I can only hope that I modulate my voice as well as her, but <laughs> you can probably play a drinking game with orange juice about how many times my voice will crack over the course of this presentation. Um, so, you know, drink up. Um, uh, good morning, my name is Frankie, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here and speak with all of you about what I've been working on for the past year, and I appreciate my undergrad friends coming out under the, the heat and the, the pressure of finals week to support their kind of crotchety old senior friend. Um, uh, and before I uh, jump in here, I just want to say a special hello and thank you to my mom, Betsy, who's sitting right over there, and to my dad, Larry, who's watching the live stream at home in Ottawa, Canada. Um, in the kind of end of semester crunch, it's really easy to forget um, how lucky I am to be doing this work and to get to do the work I love at a place that's as special as MIT. And that's in large part due to their support. Um, and so I just want to say thank you very much. And I love you. Um, so why did I choose this topic? Uh, well, I grew up in the 90s, as many of my classmates did. Um, and I've always kind of been in awe of technology. Um, and as I grew up, I saw it, uh, technology, information technology, what we might think of as you know, the computers, the internet, the really, really smart devices that are now in all of our pockets, I'm sure, that we're all trying really hard not to check. Um, uh, and I, I realized that these devices were influencing everything around me. Um, and they were really shaping how people interact with each other and the world and the politics we consumed and the information we got a chance to see. Um, and when people tell me that, you know, Tech doesn't have politics. What are you talking about? I just uh, showed them this picture <laughs> of an eagle uh, taking down a drone, and I say, you know, checkmate. So, <laughs> but, uh, but but in all seriousness, uh, technology is everywhere. And as the late great historian of science, Melvin Kranzberg, once put it, um, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Um, which sounds like a funny funny idea, but. It's the same thing in the case of our educational system, which is what I'm focusing on for my thesis, uh, K through 12, kindergarten uh, through 12th grade education. Um, technology can be used to great success, it can be used to great failure, but it's never not, it doesn't never have an effect. It always has some effect on our story. Um, so with that kind of guiding concept, let's jump right into the story here. So the year is 2013. Um, which is five years ago, I'm realizing, which is very alarming. Um, and the second largest school district in the United States, the Los Angeles Unified School District, has just made uh, a lot of news by announcing that they were going to spend $1.3 billion to put iPads preloaded with the curriculum from the Pearson uh, textbook, uh, preloaded uh, curriculum via software onto every single one of these iPads and give it out to each of their 600,000 students. It's a really big, ambitious project. And one of the main goals of this project was stated in its messaging as uh, bringing a personalized curriculum to each student by way of having this one-to-one -one device program. So it was a very high profile, high stakes kind of situation. It was sort of the first big test about whether or not bringing one-to-one -one device programs would really bring about a major change in US classrooms. So uh, <laughs> the program went off the rails pretty quickly. Um, there were a lot of factors. Uh, less than a week after the devices arrived, students hacked past the firewalls, as we tend to do. Um, <laughs> and you know they found some non-academic content. Um, and within the first year, it was revealed that the curriculum wasn't ready, the software wasn't working, no one really felt like their needs were being met. Um, and then in late 2014, the FBI showed up uh, <laughs> to the district headquarters because it turned out the superintendent had been corresponding with Pearson before the bidding for the contract was officially announced. So there was some nice collusion, which never bodes well. Um, so this, this was a very high profile failure and it was held up by both sides of the ed or not ed tech um, camps in, in saying, you know, 
this is a huge waste of money. Why are we buying all these devices when they don't even serve our students and they don't even show to improve learning outcomes? And the other side is like, no, this can actually really work. This was just very poor planning and not everyone's going to be colluding. And there, it was a big debate. Um, and so how did we get here? Um, people who study educational technology, ed tech, as I'll be referring to it, are quick and correct to point out that the conversation around ed tech has been around as long as the US educational school system has been around. Um, the first textbook was printed in 1690. Um, very crucible era, right? Um, <laughs> and then in uh, 1913, Thomas Edison himself said that you know printed textbooks would soon be obsolete, and students would learn everything by motion picture. Um, so you know, more or less, kind of, not really. Uh, good try, Eddie. Um, but uh, uh, but this particular ed tech revolution that I'm talking about here is the movement that we've seen in the past five years to these kind of one-to-one -one device programs where students each have, if they don't own them, they have access every day in all their classes to a tablet or laptop or device through which they can connect to the internet, they can use software, they can email and collaborate, and they can um, personalize. Well, the companies building these devices are saying that these can be used for personalized learning, which I will divine um, in the next slide. So where did this kind of come from? What's at the stage for this? Um, well, remember this guy? Uh, <laughs> so uh, back in 2013, um, Obama's Department of Education under Arne Duncan announced an initiative called Connect Ed, um, with the E and the D capitalized for education, kind of a plan of words. Um, and Obama said, you know, I'm not going to do impression because it wouldn't never suffice. Um, that this program was going to bring. Uh, all the classrooms in the U.S. into the digital age and bring them into the 21st century. And so the initiative really had four pillars. Uh, the first one was connectivity. Basically get 99% of students uh, connected to high-speed broadband internet access. Second pillar was uh, devices. Get public and private sector partnerships to get uh, devices donated from Microsoft, Apple, Google to schools that needed them. Um, and the third pillar was content, get ebooks, uh, free software, um, all sorts of content, get the paywalls brought down so students could use it. And the fourth was teacher training and superintendent training. Through this process called Future Ready, um, Obama and his department convened uh, superintendents and teachers and sort of gave them these manuals in which they signed a pledge to say, yes, we'll take this technology and yes, we'll try to use it in our schools to bring about personalized learning. Um, and so the first piece, the connectivity piece, was made through a change to uh, a Clinton era, Bill Clinton era, uh, policy called E-Rate, um, which is handled by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. And basically it allows schools and libraries to reimburse, to get reimbursed when they pay money to get new fiber laid or to connect to existing fiber to get uh, broadband high speed access for their schools. Um, and the year rate budget was increased by more than a billion dollars in 2014. And as you can see from these figures, uh, a lot of people started applying. And so we went from around just one third of, of students having what the FCC considers uh, uh, being ready for digital learning with a certain amount of broadband to almost 94%, and that's a jump of around uh, 3.5 million students more connected. Um, so that was very effective. Um, and uh, one of the, oh, <laughs> I, I'm told that this picture is Obama actually taking a video of that student, otherwise it kind of just looks like he's in Jurassic Park and he's found a dino egg. Um, <laughs> What is this? Uh, but, no. Uh, uh, but one of the narratives in the, uh, the messaging around uh, connected and the, the idea of bringing these devices and all this connectivity to the classroom was that with technology you could start to close equity gaps. And students can face equity gaps in all sorts of ways in their schools. Uh, everything from low income neighborhoods having smaller budgets, not being able to afford basic infrastructure for classrooms. Um, they can face uh, gaps in, in linguistics equity if they aren't taught in their first language. 
They can face uh, programmatic inequity in which they become caught in cycles of low expectation where you know, low income students might not achieve and receive the, the right amount of um, instruction and so expectations get lower and it perpetuates itself. Um, and they can face instructional inequity if they're not being taught in a way that's conducive to how they learn. Um, and that can include anything from learning disabilities, physical disabilities, or just different learning styles. And so cognitive development researchers have long established that kids learn in very different ways. And I think that every parent in the room can also uh, confirm that. Um, and so uh, it, it was formalized back in the 70s, I think, in this model by um, married researchers, the Duns. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but uh, some thrive with reading out loud, others prefer to you know, um, see things, others prefer, prefer to use their hands. There's all sorts of different ways kids learn best. Um, and chances are in a classroom, oh, that was a big scroll. Okay. <laughs> so chances are in a classroom, there will be a few students um, who won't be learning properly through the given method of instruction. I think the whole kind of teacher lecturing the blackboard model has gotten stuck in our heads as, as kind of the, the main model that, that classes are run, but that's actually not true. But even so, it's very difficult in a one teacher to 22 students classroom for the teacher to meet everybody's needs. And so the idea is that with personalized learning, um, there's a bunch of definitions floating around, but I particularly like this one by James Rickabaugh, who was a former superintendent and now directs the Institute for Personalized Learning, so he seems to know what it is. Um, <laughs> it's an approach to learning and instruction that is designed around individual learner readiness, strengths, needs, and interests. Learners are active participants in setting goals, planning learning paths, tracking progress, and determining how learning will be demonstrated. So basically, uh, technology can absolutely help with this because personalizing learning is a lot of work. Um, and it, it can have great success if delivered properly, but um, you know, it's, it's very challenging for a teacher to personalize learning to 22 different students uh, without a bit of help. And so technology can absolutely be an aid in doing this. Um, software loaded onto devices can help roll out information in new ways to suit the learner. Um, you know, performance metric trackers can help teachers keep tabs on where students are and which ones need more help. Uh, and more access to the internet and access to content online broadens the scope of what students could encounter and be interested in. Maybe they would find something that was really their passion that they wouldn't have had access to had they not had the connectivity. Um, but also along these lines, and along the kind of public-private uh, sector partnerships that came through with Connect Ed, was this kind of rise of a narrative called the disruption narrative. Um, and it sort of became um, a narrative that education was now kind of considered a market. Since uh, these companies, the Apples, what I call big ed te tech, uh, realized that um, our schools are full of potential customers, um, it became sort of phrasing education in the educational system in terms of the business model of disruption, where there's an established group of players, which are the people who you know, typically run the schools, <laughs> uh, superintendents, you know, principals, uh, educators, and then there's kind of this new camp that wants to disrupt the previous model. Um, and this, this narrative is problematic in a lot of ways, I think because it um, diminishes the work that teachers have been doing for a really long time to reshape their own classrooms and to bring personalized learning in without bringing in technology um, and to use technology in their own ways. Um, and oftentimes the, the big ed techs of the world go so far as to totally monopolize the reform efforts by opening their own schools because they, they assume they can do it better. Um, and the danger with this is that, you know, I'm sure you've all heard the narrative, our schools are broken, they're not serving our students. When there's that bar that's so low, people are very willing to kind of go along with half-baked plans to bring in a ton of uh, ed tech to say, hey, this is better than doing nothing, let's try this ed tech and see if it'll help fix our broken school. Um, and so, beyond this narrative, and the LA iPad fiasco, I wanted to see if there were schools that were doing personalized learning and using technology and seeing great success. 
And unsurprisingly, uh, you don't hear about them a lot, but there are a lot of them. And one of them is this district in uh, 30 miles west of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that I got the pleasure of visiting on a very cold day in March um, called Kettle Moraine. And I got to spend uh, a day with their superintendent, Pat Decklotz, um, and she showed me around their 10 schools, and I met with uh, teachers, students, educators, and spoke uh, for a while with her about how Kettle Moraine approached personalized learning before they approached the technology piece. So um, in, in, 20, uh, in 2005, actually, the, the budget was cut for Kettle Moraine, and so they, they became underfunded as a school, and Pat Decklotz was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and so she, she realized that she had to sort of find more creative ways to deliver better learning outcomes to her students. And she said, you know, we could redecorate and, you know, just kind of change the, the, the decorations here and try to make the school look neat and pretty and try to get by with what we have. Or we could completely remodel and do something brave and try to get the whole community involved in changing the way we approach learning here. And so she went for the, the remodeling, because she's a, a very brave woman, I found. Um, and they held a focus group for a year and a half with 25 community members to talk about you know, what their values were as a community. And they brought in students, and they brought in teachers, and they had everyone involved from the start to talk about what personalization meant to them. And that was kind of the first two uh, things that I jotted down in, in having a successful personalized learning program, you need a strong superintendent leadership uh, or sort of a, a champion of personalized learning, a teacher or anyone who is really willing to take that risk to change the way a school does something. Um, and then you also need community involvement from the start uh, because, you know, Parents care about their kids, and community members care about the, the people who will be working with them in a few years, and it really takes a village. Um, so it's sort of the second thing I noted down was that you need to have the community buy in and accept the personalized learning and be involved and feel like they have a voice in it from the start. So then the next step was to actually start doing this. Um, so the third step for, for them was to start small and scale up. So Deck Lots and her team started having feasibility studies with little micro classrooms of 10 kids for several years, uh, testing out kind of different kinds of charter schools um, and eventually expanding those charter schools to be larger and larger, like a school within a school. These aren't separate schools, they're just kind of micro schools within the larger schools in their district. And then eventually broadening that personalized learning out to all the students across the district. Um, and what really informed what the charter schools were focused on was the community values. Um, and so the, the fourth thing I noticed was an emphasis on place-based learning and kind of immersing and acknowledging the culture and the community um, where the schools are situated. And so in Kel Moraine, there is sort of a deep appreciation and cultural legacy for the arts, specifically for Irish dancing. Um, everyone brought that up to me. Um, and, and music especially, and they also really value global leadership and healthcare um, because a lot of health companies are anchored in Milwaukee. Um, and so that kind of informed how they decided what kind of charter to test out. So they uh, tested out a charter that really allowed students to go out with the community, form partnerships, and in high school, they would get to go and shadow doctors or work with the fire and rescue team. Um, and it was personalized learning, but it wasn't necessarily relying on any piece of technology. It was personalized in the fact that these kids got a chance to explore careers they might want, got a chance to uh, you know, understand the values and the heritage of their community. Um, and technology absolutely helped with that as you know, when I was walking around the high school, there were a lot of kids who weren't there because they were out doing shadowing or uh, work study, and their schedules have to be flexible. So they would use technology to kind of plan their schedules, and uh, the teachers would use it to keep track of them, and they would use it to uh, manage their time and uh, report on their learning. But it wasn't driven by the technology. It was driven by the students' interests. Um, and. This is over at the uh, middle school, um, and 
basically, another thing I saw at Kettle Moraine that was um, very important was this idea of a learner continuum and a learner profile. And uh, the students I spoke to were all incredibly articulate in um, expressing who they were as learners, what they wanted to learn, what their strengths and weaknesses were, so much more so than I was when I was in eighth grade. Um, uh, and they, they can do so because there's this sort of process they go through whenever they go to Kettle Marine School where they sit down with the teacher and they talk about where they are as learners and where they want to be. And that's kind of a learning continuum. Um, and one thing that Kettle Marine also does is these multi-age classrooms where, um, you know, kids who would have been in grades six, seven, and eight are now working in a similar space and they have the same teacher for three years and they work together. Uh, the older kids get to teach little mini modules to the younger kids and the younger kids can work with the older kids if they need help. Um, and it's sort of more about a skills continuum than chunkating it. I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> Making it into chunks uh, based on grade level. Um, and so that, that allowed a lot more time and a lot more flexibility in the students in having different ways to demonstrate that they were understanding something. Um, two of the girls I spoke with at the middle school were going to teach a workshop on narrative fiction. And my mom's going to roll her eyes at this, but they were going to use Harry Potter as uh, their, their kind of guiding key to it. Um, and they were just so excited about getting a chance to teach their younger students um, and about something they were really passionate about, but also meet curriculum goals. Um, and so finally, the, the tech piece does come in eventually because uh, Cal Moraine uh, has a one-to-one -one device program, but the partnership is not with a big tech company per se. The students and their parents um, pay for half of the cost of the device over the course of their time there, and the school pays the other half. And they have a designated tech team that has a small list of programs they've approved, and they work with the tech companies so that they can have their own rollout schedule because oftentimes there's uh, security breaches when they like roll out new features and the tech team gets to uh, decide when they want to roll out those new features for their students. So they have a really good lock on student data and <clears throat> they have a good transparency policy with uh, uh, parents and, and teachers about how data is being used. And uh, technology isn't essential for the personalized learning to happen at Kettle Moraine, but it really does help because uh, I was talking to like a sixth grader about how she sent her first emails um, <laughs> because she was doing a project about a Hawaiian queen and she actually reached out to the Hawaiian queen's great great niece over email and that was like one of the first emails she ever sent. Um, and I was like, wow, the first email I ever sent, I can't even remember, it wasn't that important. <laughs> um, but it, it really, it enables more personalization and more learning, but ultimately it starts with the student and what they want to learn. Um, and having the tech around also enables lessons on digital citizenship and being a student and a person in the 21st century. Um, and when I was visiting the elementary school, one of the, the, I think, second grade teachers was talking about how they usually do a mapping project. And he had all the, the papier mache out and, you know, he was ready to like build a physical map of the city. And all his second graders were like, no, we want to use Minecraft. Um, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, it's kind of a software platform where you can build things with blocks. Um, and a bunch of people can work on it at the same time. And the teacher was like, oh, but I already got all the paint out. And then he realized uh, you know, how, how excited the kids were about it. And so he said, you know what, like, we'll build our map of Milwaukee with Minecraft blocks online. And this is going to be a lesson about you know, not knocking over each other's stuff and respecting each other's work and making sure that your work is known and you know it's going to be a lesson in collaboration in a digital space which is something that you know you need to know how to do as an adult these days um, so i think that uh, using the tech as uh, lessons for dis digital citizenship um, and you know building in lessons that couldn't be completed without the tech um, is another step that they use very well and so I wish I could get into all of the districts that are doing amazing work because Kettle Moraine is really just one small, fairly homogenous district that is uh, affluent enough to have a device program like it does, but there are schools across the country from Miami-Dade that has uh, 3, 000, or 350, 350,000 students to schools of around 500 students like Brooklyn Lab in Brooklyn, New York, 
Um, and even the LA Unified School District is trying again with the, the tech program, but they're bringing in consultants um, from a nonprofit to help keep students at the center of the, of the project. Um, and technology, if I learn anything from this, is that technology can absolutely help deliver personalized learning. And I think it's going to be necessary to do so for the 70 million kids going through school every year. Um, but if not leveraged properly, it, it's no more useful than any other tool. Um, it's no more useful than you know, having a pencil. Um, it has to be incorporated properly. And personalized learning really begins long before the technology and requires a shift in the way we think about our students. Um, and it's a lot of work. And educators are, are working tirelessly across the country to get it done. Um, and you know, I know the, the narrative of our broken schools probably won't go away anytime soon. Um, and I'm sure that there's stuff that we'd all like to fix about it. Um, but you know, educating 70 million kids every year to become better citizens is one of our nation's most ambitious collective projects. And it advances slowly. Um, but I think that it's, it's one of our most important projects. And so it should be one that we really pay attention to what kind of politics and what kind of forces are at play in shaping how kids are taught. Um, so yeah, technology isn't the savior of personalized learning. Uh, but if leveraged properly, it can help deliver it to more people. Thank you. technologies and uh, platforms that are being designed and if leveraged properly can help with accessibility if say someone has a learning disability or a physical disability um, and that can range uh, in you know accessibility features like making the text larger or having things come out audio uh, if, if someone is, is blind um, and that can go sort of scale down to acknowledging different learning styles so if someone learns better uh, using their hands, uh, there could be kind of an activity that allows them to sort of interact with their screen more, tactile, um, kinesthetic, kinetic. Um, there's many levels of which uh, it can be personalized. I think that the trick that I found is that it can't all rely on the devices. Like the devices can be very powerful, especially for content that has to be relatively standardized, like math. Um, but in terms of other content and skills, there's a lot of times when uh, devices and content can be a great assist to help kids collaborate or, or investigate new topics. But the personalization really comes from how the, the students on the team decide their roles, or how they decide what they're going to do their project about, or how they decide you know, how they're going to demonstrate their learning to their teacher. I know standardized tests have a problem all their own, but have there been any comparison between those special districts like the Kettle Moraine uh, or the Brooklyn Lab uh, versus districts that have not adopted these new procedures? Has there been any comparison between whether this is uh, uh, lifting up uh, the, uh, the verbal and analytical and math achievements of these students? Right. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marsha. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, that's the million dollar question, I guess. It's always like, does it work? And I think that it's a whole other thesis I could write about, you know, testing in and of itself and the different arguments against the Common Core and uh, different sort of tests that test for a certain metric but don't necessarily encompass kind of 
the untestable, like how someone is progressing in their time management or um, in their sort of social justice. Um, and there have been a, a small number of tests done so far um, because this has been happening the last five years. There hasn't been a huge body of testing and most of it has been fairly inconclusive. Um, at Kettle Moraine, at least, they do a special test in addition to the state level testing. Uh, it's like OECD, like it's an economics thing. Um, but basically, it tests kids in different schools around the world, and they're testing above the global average in, in math and language comprehension and writing. Um, and it, it found that the students who were in the little charter schools, um, which they're still working on expanding out to the full high schools and, and middle schools in the district, they're testing better than their peers who don't receive as much time for personalized learning. Um, so it's still a challenge of scale because it requires a lot more work on the part of the teachers and uh, you know it requires a lot of logistics. I think people forget about that sometimes. You just like throw the technology in there and then it just magically fixes things. But it requires a lot of light work on, on the parts of the educators and reorganizing the classroom spaces and everything. So to answer your question, uh, Kettle Moraine is doing, uh, is testing better and I believe the scores at Brooklyn Lab are improved. Um, Brooklyn Lab is a really interesting case because it's in a low income neighborhood and they really tried to be representative of the neighborhood they were in, um, to have a student body that was predominantly composed of the same makeup as the, as the community. Um, and so they have a lot of kids with disabilities um, and they are still seeing improved test scores. Um, I can think up the citation for you if you'd like. Um, but yeah, basically the, the, the long standing question is, no, we haven't seen um, major test score studies that have shown that personalized learning is definitely better. But the argument that people make is that the tests don't necessarily show the progress that personalized learning makes. Um, so happy to chat more about academic testing and the pitfall, <laughs> pitfalls thereof. Um, but yeah. Thanks, Frank. That was, um, it was fascinating working with you all year, and, it, and it's a lovely presentation of, of uh, where you got to in, in, in this project. Um, I'm curious, you know, you talked here, and, and, and we talked certainly uh, in, in the course of doing your thesis about the sort of the, the anatomy of a well implemented personalized learning process. And uh, I'm just wondering if you have a sort of similar anatomy for the for when, when you know, the ed tech proponents, the, the broken school and, and the um, disruption, do you have sort of a, uh, perhaps, you know, betray my, my, my bias here, a pathology of what they get wrong? Um, you know, what went wrong in LA, what goes wrong perhaps in a sort of tech-led tech as opposed to tech-following approach to this, to this kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um there's kind of this, um, there's kind of this uh, notion of an algorithmically driven world, you know, and if you have enough algorithms and enough data, you can optimize anything. And the thing about that is it depends on what data you have and what content you have and what you're working with. And so, generally speaking, I'm not speaking for every ed tech developer here, but a lot of the larger ones have seen personalized learning as kind of a, a path through standardized content, but it's been algorithmically fitted to you. It's not necessarily your interests, it just takes what it has in its library, and based on how you do on certain activities, it'll recommend more activities to you. And so, I've heard some analogies about like how, you know, on Netflix you can choose your movies and they might all be crappy movies, but because the algorithm has decided that these are the crappy movies you like, uh, it's now personalized. Um, and, and that's an overgeneralization, but I think that a lot of things can't be standardized, which is the challenging part of education, and I think that that sort of notion that you can standardize everything and then also personalize it by carving out different paths through standardized content, um, just using algorithms and uh, sort of exclusively using the tech, that's kind of the fallacy, or that's kind of the pathology of what goes wrong, 
it starts with the idea that we have this iPad and now the, the iPad is going to kind of program the child through the curriculum. When in reality, you want to start with the child and have the child program the iPad if they want to, but then also do projects that don't involve the iPad and use the iPad only for projects that uh, it, it really makes a difference as opposed to using any other kind of tool. Maybe I have one more question. Hey, kind of a follow-up question that was just asked. When you start the thesis, were you more focused on looking to see how technology was impacting education, or were you more interested in personalized education and realizing that technology could or may not be a benefit? Just kind of curious, because it seems like you came to a different conclusion partway through it. Yeah. The success I had in mind. Absolutely. Um, like I said, I'm a total tech nerd, and so I think I always go in expecting I think I've become more aware over the, over the past year, which is good, because grad school you should learn stuff. Um, but <laughs> but um, every tech success story, um, it's, it's always very kind of a, a specific instance, and it always spawns a lot of other stories that might not necessarily find the same amount of uh, success. So I took a class in the fall on cyber policy, because um, I was very interested in that, um, and it was taught by one of President Obama's chief cyber policy guys, uh, R. David Edelman, and he had worked with uh, Arne Duncan, the Secretary of Education, on the Connected program. And at first I was like, this is insane, the fact that we got from one third of schools connected to broadband to now almost 94%. Like, how does that happen? How do you connect an entire country with uh, schools that quickly? I was really interested in kind of the process by which we, everybody gets online, like whether it has to come from top down from the government or if it can kind of come up organically. Um, and what I learned is that that's just the beginning of the story, is that uh, this whole this fascinating process by which they design a program to get the lights on and get the infrastructure ready really just set the stage for a whole lot of new players and issues to come into the, the foray because once they had the, the technology and infrastructure set up, um, and then these private and partner, private sector partnerships, um, which are really great because they donated a lot of iPads and, and technology and did a lot of good. But then there was also this kind of new emerging narrative that, hey, ed tech is this new market, and maybe these companies can do it better than uh, the, the schools were doing it previously. Um, so I started out being interested just in how you connect a whole country and what's, what's the process in doing that and how does that affect education. And then I slowly realized that now that all these schools are connected and now that they're all kind of dipping their toes into the ed tech pool or jumping in as LA did, um, you run into a lot of issues because there's different kind of social agendas and there's different kinds of um, different ways to approach personalized learning. And, and people have very different definitions based on what they're trying to sell. Um, if they're trying to get an iPad into the hands of the student, they'll say personalized learning can be accomplished with this iPad. But if you're a teacher and you're, and you're starting from the ground up, you're saying, wait, maybe personalized learning, the personalized learning, the personalization happens before you even get the iPads in. So it was kind of a process of discovery, um, which is what's great about journalism, because as soon as you find one story, you always find like 10 more. Thank you very much, Frankie. Uh, oh. Our, um, you could have a naked lunch. Uh, no, not naked lunch. Naked guy. Where uh, Leslie Nielsen goes to the bathroom. Oh, got it. Obscure reference, apparently. Um, okay, uh, our next presentation, um, I think everyone is in for a real treat. Uh, TJ McCauley came to us from the Philippines. Uh, where he is a writer and journalist, um, and for his thesis, he explored the history um, of scientific exploration in his home country uh, and looked at the, uh, that legacy and, and what it will be like moving forward. 
So uh, he'll be ready in a second as soon as he sets up and help yourself with more coffee and OJ. from the title, it's a story that covers a very long period of time, thousands of years in fact. Uh, but hopefully my talk won't take that long. <laughs> um, so I think as far as this, this story has a personal dimension to it, and um, even though the science of it all spans such a long period of time, the, my story begins relatively recently in the 1980s in Manila. Uh, I grew up in the nation's capital, and uh, this is what it looked like back then. And uh, in the 80s, and even more so now, uh, the capital is filled with modern buildings, uh, tall structures. But I remember as a kid, uh, my grandfather, who survived the Second World War, was a soldier in the war, would take me to a street corner, stand me there and say, look at all of these buildings. Uh, immediately after the war, there was nothing. Everything was carpet bombed. Um, there were 100,000 civilian casualties alone, uh, more than uh, soldiers on both sides, Japanese and Philippines combined. Um, and that also meant that uh, so much of, of Manila, uh, centuries old uh, churches, uh, homes, buildings were, were destroyed. As a matter of fact, even today, uh, the only, the old, probably one of the, if not the oldest, yes, the oldest structure in Manila now is a single church uh, that only survived the bombing because it was used as a, 
as a shelter. And this, for me, uh, shaped a lot of my thinking growing up because it gave me a profound sense of loss. And it, uh, even when I, even when I, when I uh, eventually became a writer and uh, I, I, I delved into uh, science and technology, I still thought about uh, all of that. You know, and, and, and that got me to thinking about uh, how much we lost and what, what was there before, long before. Uh, when I came here in 2017, uh, the first thing I did, as in I just, well, I, I came in the evening, but the next, the, the next morning I, I, I went out of my dorm, I just live on campus, I went out of my dorm and intentionally got myself lost. Uh, so fortunately, I found myself, uh, find, fortunately I found my way back, otherwise I wouldn't be here to finish the program. <laughs> but uh, going around Cambridge, and even at MIT, one of the things that impressed me the most was that you have buildings that are more than half a century old. And that was, that was amazing for me, you know? I mean, even now when I walk through the, am I walking in the right direction? Even when I'm walking through the, the uh, infinite corridor, you know, sometimes I just, I, I probably look like an idiot when I do that. I touch, I touch the wall and say, man, this is, this is old, you know? <laughs> even if it, it was built just in the early 1900s. But anyway, so that, I just wanted to say that because that's what uh, informed me as a person, as a writer. And the story of the Philippines itself, of course, I want to go as far back as I could, try to understand uh, what, uh, what, what we had in terms of science and technology, um, as far back as we could. And that's what my thesis was about. So how far do we go back? First of all, before I go into that, um, I, I want to show you this image of the Philippine archipelago. Uh, so this is Manila. Um, this is the largest island, Luzon. And the whole archipelago itself is surrounded by very deep waters. So Pacific Ocean, uh, Mariana Stretch over here, some of the deepest waters in the world, West Philippine Sea. And over here, this, you might find this interesting um, the Trekkies among us might find this interesting. This is the Sulu Sea, from which uh, Ikaru Sulu, uh, the character that is named, because Gene Roddenberry fought in the Philippines. Uh, another bit of side trivia, even uh, Rod Serling also fought in the Philippines back in the war. But I wanted to show you this slide because it shows you just how difficult it is to get to the Philippines. These are two archaeological sites I'll be talking about in a while. But imagine that vast distance. There are a few islands here, but they're small and scattered about. And even the, the Indonesian, Indonesian Malaysian Peninsula down below, which is in this map, uh, there are still gaps of water, which even during the Great Ice Age, so I've been told, uh, were still uh, covered in, in water. And I'll get to why that's important in a while. So uh, until relatively recently, uh, the oldest uh, hu uh, the oldest human remains Actually, the oldest human remains in the Philippines are still those that were found in Callao Cave in 2010. Uh, this is what it looks like now. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful cave. Uh, it's already, the main chamber has actually been converted into a chapel, uh, but it spans uh, seven chambers deep. And there are, there are uh, there's evidence of human habitation spanning thousands of years. Uh, you have, archaeologists have found everything from um, Chinese pottery, gla uh, glass beads, uh, to medium heaps from, from older periods. And it was here that uh, a human metatarsal bone, uh, a, foot, a foot bone, barely the width of a, uh, of a pencil, was found in 2010. Um, to date, it has not been confirmed if it is uh, human or hominin, if it is uh, uh, homo sapiens, or I think the speculation right now is it's uh, homo erectus. But uh, it proves that, uh, that there was habitation as far as 67,000 years ago in that, uh, in that island. Um, and just to show how, how much is going on uh, in terms of archaeology and the you know, discovery of new finds. So 
This was the oldest point that I had in my thesis when I submitted it just a month ago. And then, just two weeks ago, I, I wrote Marsha a very, uh, a very startled email that, saying that there had been new, found, new finds discovered in a place just a few miles away, in Kalinga province. This is what it looks like. It's a uh, valley. There were uh, fossils uh, found of a rhino, an extinct rhinoceros. They didn't find human remains, but they did find traces of uh, butchery. So there were scrape marks, there were cut marks, and uh, the, the bones were broken up so that whoever killed the rhino could get at the marrow. So it's indirect evidence that there were hominins, two using hominins in the area at the time. Uh, although the actual remains of the, of the, of the hominins have yet to be found. But for me, what was very interesting about all of this wasn't so much the age of the fossils themselves, but how they got there. And that's why I wanted to, I endeavored to show the map earlier. Um, even in the last ice age, uh, that particular island, the Philippines in general, was surrounded by, uh, by deep seas, by deep waters. And uh, it's still not certain whether these hominins and, hu uh, and modern humans, if they got there, uh, intentionally by boat, or they, some, there's some speculation that that uh, that they might they might have uh, washed ashore unintentionally, probably during a storm, managed to cling onto a log or something and find their way there. Um, still a lot of contention there. But uh, one of the archaeologists of the Callao discovery uh, was unequivocal in say, when he said that. Um, it's likely that they possessed sea craft making in this period. And one of the sources for my uh, thesis, uh, Filipino Kami Jr., uh, posited that. I mean, if there, if there were tool makers as, as early as 700,000 years ago, all, uh, all, what kind of technologies did they have? Or what, and what kind of technologies did they, did they develop over that time frame? Uh, but the historical record, at least for now, is silent. Uh, what we do know is that uh, half a millennium after uh, Callao Man, there was what we know as the Great Austronesian Expansion. Uh, this has been talked about a lot uh, in popular literature. And basically what it says is that uh, people from China around 7,000 BC went through Taiwan, then the Philippines, then spread out across the Pacific all the way to uh, Easter Island, and then some of them went through the, uh, the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, we know this because of two things. We have uh, the linguistic evidence, uh, which points to a common origin. So basically how that works <coughs> is that um, scientists have looked at uh, the Austronesian languages and, compare, uh, and compared uh, the various languages. So what happens is, the speakers of a language, when they, when they break up, when they separate into different groups, of course the language will shift, it will change, um, and words over time uh, evolve, they, they, they change. And so you can very generally trace those back and figure out, you can even figure out how long ago two groups separated based on how different their languages were. And, and the picture that we have is that all of these places <coughs> share common language roots, and that uh, even the people who set out into the remotest places of the world came from somewhere in Southeast Asia, or the Philippines, as a jump off point. Um, that is, of course, shaky, because after all, you can speak a language without necessarily being born into a culture, right? Uh, but that is also supported by genetic evidence. Um, there have been surveys of, uh, of of the genes, not just of people themselves, but even of, uh, of, of animals that have been domesticated and shuttled back and forth. And they support uh, this, this, uh, this uh, migration. Uh, at least uh, they, it, it's certain that they all share a common origin. Uh, it's also interesting that, to note that uh, the genetic evidence also uh, pre 
uh, of uh, the, the, gen the, the genes of Filipinos. Some of the material in, in Filipino genes actually predates Austronesian expansion, which means that, uh, that it's likely that uh, the Austronesians, when they came into the Philippines circa 3000 BC, they had encountered uh, the descendants of Kalyongan and uh, the Kalinga tool makers. So that, to me, and for a lot of observers, speaks of uh, uh, a long, several millennia of, uh, of population, several millennia of uh, generations of seafarers uh, who, have, who have lived in the islands. And so that raises the question, could Filipinos have been part of the building of Angkor Wat? Could, could Filipino ancestors have built uh, the, the Moai statues of Rapa Nui, Easter Island? Uh, there is no direct evidence of this yet. But there is evidence that Filipinos, at least a thousand years ago, were already in contact with uh, their neighbors. This is a gold statue, which is now in the Chicago Field Museum, discovered in 1917 in the southern part of the Philippines. It is of a Buddhist uh, goddess. Um, it was it washed ashore on on a, on a river, and it it's at least an indication that the people of the area were in contact with uh, Buddhist civilizations at least that far along. But one thing is clear: uh, our people had the technology to travel great distances, to travel across the seas, and there is. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are historical uh, documents that, point, that, that describe a particular kind of boat called the Balangay, uh, which was used in these voyages. Um, but, uh, but until relatively recently, uh, until the 1970s, all we had were uh, written accounts of these boats. But, uh, in the 1970s, in Bhutan, in the southern Philippines, uh, again, this is Sulu uh, Sea for reference, um, these, treasure hunt these treasure hunters, incidentally, before I forget, uh, the statue was found somewhere here, so it's not far away from where the statue was. In this place called Bhutan, it was once, uh, it was, it, it, right now it's inland, but it used to open up to the sea. Uh, so it, uh, so, in the 1970s, uh, uh, treasure hunters found these long planks of, uh, of a boat. Um, the, and it was, when they looked at it, it, it showed uh, the construction techniques that were described in old texts. Uh, the, and it was, the it was the first confirmed uh, discovery of an actual balanai. And the balana is interesting in terms of science and technology, in terms of technology particularly, um, because the Spaniards were in awe of it. Um, when Spaniards arrived in the Philippines in the 1600s, they, they used carracks uh, that were meant for deep seas. But the problem with the, with the ocean waters in Southeast Asia is that they vary widely in depth. Uh, sometimes you have coral reefs popping up out of nowhere, so it's it's pretty difficult to navigate, but these boats were designed to be uh, flexible so that they could be used in these conditions. The way they were used, and this is uh, unique to the Balanay of the Philippines, they were pegged, uh, they were constructed without nails. Uh, they, you would have these dowels put into the edges and then the planks would be uh, fitted together, in, in the hull would be fitted together. And then these are, uh, these lugs here are actually raised lugs that are carved into the wood. And these would be lashed together with uh, hemp rope or, or fibers, and then this flexible rib put into place. So what this did was, it, like, a, like a Spanish fan or a uh, Chinese curtain, this allowed the hull to be flexible and light so that you could easily uh, push into shallow waters. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a replica of, of the Balangai that was constructed uh, relatively recently. And it was used to sail around the, uh, around the Philippines and Southeast Asia. 
So the design was, uh, it proved that the design was uh, seaworthy. But the story doesn't end there. So we have these balamas that were discovered in the 1970s, and they were about the size, for reference, they were about the size of a school bus. But in 2013, and this is the, this is the dig site, uh, in 2013, they discovered so something much bigger. Uh, this, this site here, this is what it looks like. And this is what they found. Uh, they found these planks. This is, this is one of the older balangas that hasn't been excavated. They kept it in the water uh, because that's the best way to, to keep it preserved. Uh, because underwater it doesn't, uh, no oxygen, it doesn't decay. But beside that, there, was this, there were these plaques that are much larger. And th there's this boat that's much larger. And here's, here is the scale. You have this person here. This is a regular size balangay. And this is the conjectured size of the one that was found. And this was, what this says is that uh, the, the boat cultures of that time were perhaps more, com more, more complex than we thought them to be. Because before this find, uh, it was thought that, uh, that the people would go back and forth on similar size balanais. But if you had a mother boat, a mother ship, then that meant you had a centralized government, you had a centralized system for coordinating uh, movements across the seas. But uh, another interesting possibility for this was that it might not have been a mother ship. It might have been a karakoa. The Karakoa is a particular kind of uh, balangay described in ancient texts that was used primarily for war. It didn't contain provisions for traveling overseas. It only contained warriors. And it was used in raids. It was used in, uh, in acquiring slaves. And it was feared. Uh, the Indonesians actually have a word for it. They called it the Korakora. Uh, in Spanish, it was uh, Karakoa in the sea. Um, and one of our historians, Walter Scott, described this, this, these, these massive warships as akin to Viking, uh, Viking boats. And so, at that, uh, between, between the, so this indicates that at least a, th a thousand years ago, up until as recently as the 18th century, uh, when the when when the balangais disappeared, no one knows exactly why they stopped being used. But it could be a uh, cultural thing, you know, as uh, as as the Spaniards brought in different technologies. But it suggests an, a, bro a practically unbroken line of uh, of uh, history of seafaring maritime history, and that also raises the question: Did we have astro navigation? Um, we, we did not, but the concept, because it's, uh, it's thought that perhaps we didn't need to. When the Austronesians came into the Philippines, they found, uh, they found rich soils, they found, uh, they found rich uh, seas, and they, they didn't, probably didn't need to move that far. And what, but what's interesting is that uh, there are traditions of uh, astronomy in the Philippines, but that are, that are not tied to navigation, but are rather tied to, uh, to the seasons, to, to harvests. Uh, we, know, we know of Orion. Uh, what we know of Orion is known to the Filipinos as uh, Balatic. Uh, this is, there are different words across the archipelago mentioning this. Uh, and it's common to all of the cultures in the Philippines. But Balatic is a boar trap, a kind of boar trap. Uh, and here's a picture of that now. So, this is Orion as it looks like in the Philippines, and this is it. You would see Orion's belt. They sell Orion's belt as a, as a kind of spear, all the other stars as the ropes that would push it forward. Uh, but, the significance, but the significance of this is that it, uh, is, is that it, it was tied into the planting and harvesting seasons. And wrapping this all up, there is an untold heritage of exploration in the Philippines that has yet to be uh, revisited, that has yet to be explored. And this is a picture of uh, this, a satellite that we launched in 2013. And I think it's, at, as I said in my thesis, it's apt that we, we revisit this, uh, this history even as we're moving forward into space. 
And who knows, in some distant future, uh, archaeologists in some distant future might find uh, a, a Philippine-made, a Philippine-made sea, uh, or Philippine-made space faring vessel, an interstellar balangan. And this is that is that's the end of my thesis, but that's also the start of my <laughs> personal journey when I go back to the Philippines. It's something that I really like to revisit. Uh, yeah, clearly Alvin is not amused with my antics. Uh, but I would like to wrap up by leaving you with this. Uh, to my family, my classmates, uh, professors, and friends, um, I'd like to give you this, this phrase written in ancient Tagalog script. Maglayag tayo sa mga tala. It can be, it can be read, the way the script is written is it can be read in one of two, way, two ways. Translated, it means it can be read either as uh, be free among the stars, or set sail among the stars. The word, uh, this, this word can be interpreted as either to be free or to set sail. And uh, for me and my ancestors, it was probably the same thing. Thank you. centuries and it differs. Uh, there are various technologies across Southeast Asia, the Chinese junks for instance. Um, I am not aware of any uh, texts or, uh, or researches into how these were connected to each, uh, to each other. Um, I'm curious, what was it like reporting on uh, reporting on something that was obviously so emotionally resonant to you and meant so much to you? Did, was it difficult at all to sort of separate yourself from the story, or how did that affect your, your reporting? Uh, well, there is, a, for one thing, I think I also been it was a, a point of concern for me when I was here because I was studying Marshall. Uh, I, I wanted, I felt so detached. From, well, obviously, I'm half away, half a world away from the Philippines. So I was concerned that I wasn't in direct contact with all of this. But I think that at least afforded me some sense of uh, detachment from it. Uh, it. I think it counterbalanced uh, my emotions towards the subject. Uh, but having said that, I also think it is important for uh, where I stand to put some, at least some of my emotions into it because it's something that's largely been unexplored. And especially in times now, in difficult times now, when uh, we are, we are, we need, you know, uh, we need uh, things to look, look forward to, to look up to, I think it, it, it's worth putting some heart into that. <laughs> um, another question. Uh, I'm, I'm curious as to the state of knowledge and, and, and uh, whether this might be another area you're interested in as you return to the Philippines. Um, and clearly, the Philippines is an archipelago, and uh, 
uh, presumably it didn't all get settled at once and all in the same way. Um, how much is known about uh, the way um, different different islands were settled, how different populations moved between them? I mean, there are different languages and different cultures up and down the Philippines, I know. Um, so uh, I'm curious if you've, if you've done sort of or if you've begun the same kind of research and, uh, and interrogation of, of the sources on exactly how the Philippines came to be um, a single, you know, ultimately a single national unit um, uh, through the deep time of its, of its, of its settlement. Well, that, that's a very good question. And if you, if we want to, if you want to think about, if you want to think about it in terms of being a nation per se, uh, that was actually imposed by, by Spain. Uh, that basically you know, cut off this whole portion of islands and said, hey, this is ours, we'll name this after King Philip II. <coughs> um, so that, uh, that's problematic, and a lot of historians are, are, are looking at that and debating that as a whole. Um, but in terms of, but if you pull, if you pull that, that out of the picture, uh, we see that there, there are a lot of intricate uh, connections to uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, people going back and forth. And even today, it's said that uh, down south in Sabah and parts of Malaysia, there are actually large uh, groups of uh, 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 Filipino-speaking uh, people there. So it's a, it's a very complicated issue. Um, genetics, in terms of genetics alone also, uh, there's, a, there's, there's still a lot that needs to be explored. Um, there are certain pockets in the Philippines that have, that, for instance, there's a, there's, some, uh, there's, some, there's a group in the highlands of Luzon uh, that has Denisovan DNA, which is why I said earlier that we're somehow connected uh, to Southeast Asia pre austronesian arrival. So it's a very complex picture that people, that, that archaeologists and uh, forensic scientists are still looking at. take a two-minute uh, bathroom break. Um, so again, uh, help yourself to refreshments. Uh, this is going to be the last presentation of the morning. We will break um, roughly from one to two is lunch. Lunch will be set up outside. Uh, no, lunch will be set lunch up, will be set up in, in here. here. Okay. Um, uh, lunch will be set up in here. You're all invited to join us for lunch, and then we will reconvene um, after this last uh, presentation, right around one, maybe a little bit after one. Yep. And uh, while they set up for lunch, we can go and do a conversation. Okay.
hit you can also just do that right up top. But yours is so cute. research, conducted a bunch of interviews, um, and then had all of those interviews wiped by the nice technicians at the Apple store, uh, and so lost all of the research that she had done. Um, and uh, she came in and was understandably very despondent, um, and I, too, was a little bit panicked. Uh, but um, we talked about it, and she picked herself up, and. Uh, did not miss a beat at all. It was really um, an incredibly impressive uh, feat of both sticking with something um, and also just recreating all of that reporting. Uh, so without further ado, for the last presentation of the morning, here is Kelsey, or Kelly, as I like to call her. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. My name is Kelsey Sippis, and my thesis was mostly reporting on the death of my hometown, which meant that in place of going to Cuba, as I had originally planned, I ended up in Cleveland, Ohio, in January, no less. Um, and I didn't grow up in Cleveland. I grew up about 45 miles um, east of it, along this Lake Erie shoreline in this kind of tiny town called Perry, Ohio. And by most accounts, Perry is kind of your typical Rust Belt suburb. Um, 9,000 people, mostly nursery farms. Um, this is on Main Street. My brother got his hair cut at this barber shop often. You know, a couple of used car dealerships. This is actually the longest um, run business in the town. You can see this kind of proud 100 year sign they have. It's a feed mill. Um, and if you were driving through Northeast Ohio by chance, you would not stop in Perry. There's not much here, despite the name of this um, bar that was about two <coughs> blocks from my house growing up, which is why I drive by, if you can't read that. And this um, was the setting for my very happy childhood. My dad's here today, so I have to say that. 
But um, <laughs> my parents moved us to Perry when I was in first grade, and this was like very much to the dismay of our family and friends on the west side of Cleveland, who um, you know just couldn't understand why they would move us to the middle of nowhere. It was, you know, I added 45 minutes to their commute to work, and to them it was, you know, akin to moving to Mars. But my parents had a reason, and this is that reason, which is the Perry Public School System, and really, you know, the really the point of pride in this town. It's a massive 100 acre school campus and this is bigger than Disneyland. Um, and it was built in the 1990s, it cost 70 million dollars to build. Um, and mind you, this is coming at a time when a lot of struggling towns were just struggling to, or surrounding towns were struggling just to stay afloat. And you know, Perry was paying teachers the highest salaries in the state and really sparing no expense. This million dollar bell tower, this bridge kind of connects um, the high school and the mil uh, middle and elementary school. We had like an art wing, a the uh, state of the art theater, these athletic facilities that were literally modeled after Olympic training facilities. Um, this is, this, for example, this is like an Olympic um, six lane pool that when this was built, the school didn't even have a swim team. It was just crazy. And this um, is where I went to school, first through 12th grade, and where I um, benefited greatly from these resources. I lip synced through an entire rendition of the music band, and I, uh, played, I played soccer on those you know, Olympic level um, facilities, although not at all to an Olympic level. And the reason for this um, school, and truly the reason we moved there, is actually behind these um, scoreboards, and that is the Perry Nuclear Power Plant. And it is about three miles north of the school, right on the shore of Lake Erie. And for 30 years, it has really poured money into Perry, the likes of which a town of this size could truly never dream of, and obviously had no idea how to spend. And there was, um, <laughs> kind of this, you know, blind, um, kind of just this belief that this plant would insulate the town from kind of the struggling industrial and manufacturing um, in industries that were kind of gutting surrounding towns. And for, for the last 30 years, that has been true. Um, but that will now change. In um, October of 2016, First Energy, well, which owns and operates the plant announced that in the absence of a state bailout, they will shut the plant down by this summer, so summer of 2018. Um, and what's at stake here is 700 jobs, and these are high paying, highly trained technical jobs, and nearly $14 million in tax revenue, um, which the school is largely reliant on and will not be you know, sustainable without. Um, so um, Perry is not alone in facing kind of a future without nuclear power. Um, in the last five years, we've lost five nuclear power plants, so we're down to 99. Um, and when I first started reporting this story, 11 more were scheduled to close by 2020, and that has now risen to 15. Um, a recent study out of MIT shows that two-thirds of our nuclear power plants are unprofitable in the next few years, so that's everything left at this time. Um, so we're really at an energy crossroads in America right now, and we have some pretty big decisions to make. And this is not meant to be a political lecture, and so take the color and positioning on this <laughs> chart. It's purely coincidental. But nuclear is 60% of our carbon-free emissions right now. And without it, most experts agree we can't be carbon-free by 2050. Um, you know, renewables just can't do it on their own. And as uh, the same study out of MIT showed, the, kind of the next round of decommissionings will raise our carbon emissions by three and a half percent, which we really just can't afford to do right now. Um, this is going to come as a surprise, but that has not really been the MO of the recent administration, which is kind of lump nuclear in with another struggling economy, uh, energy source, um, coal, under kind of this. Um, argument of reliability. So nuclear is right now 20% of all of our electricity. And they commissioned a study basically looking at, you know, without 
the plants that are scheduled to go offline and the plants we're losing in the coal industry are going to see like kind of mass blackouts and price spikes and um, their own study showed no kind of the market is working as it's intended to um, and in January the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission announced that it would not kind of permanently subsidize coal and nuclear so this came out January 9th and that's actually a day before I went to Perry um, for the first time in eight years, actually. Um, and I came home kind of to find this kind of, this decision that kind of created the first kind of mass panic, uh, or not mass, but um, subtle panic, because the bailout in for the plant has sat kind of untouched for the last year um, in Columbus. But so there was kind of a hope that Washington was going to come through for that. And that was not the case. So when I arrived at Perry, I talked to kind of four main people that were really are really involved in kind of the bigger forces at play here, the politics. And one of those is Jack Thompson, the Perry superintendent. And he, you know, he even traveled to DC to kind of lobby on behalf of um, the town to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, prior to that decision in January. Um, and he's um, just been very kind of swept up in it because the Perry schools will be the hardest hit with that lo loss of tax revenue. Um, he kind of walked me through the budget and they're not sustainable without it. They, they won't have a balanced budget. I talked to Jerry Serino, a county commissioner who is probably the most vocal, you know, supporter of the bailout in Washington and also in his like disdainment for Je um, Governor John Kasich. I had to remind Jerry several times that he was on the record because he's just like very blunt about how he speaks about him. Um, and we had, you know, we had a lot of long talks because Jerry is, in his own words, about as conservative as you can be. And um, so, and now uh, he's kind of finding himself advocating for something um, that goes against his, you know, very ideals. I talked to Jennifer Young, who has lived in Perry for 14 years and is the, communica the communications manager for First Energy Solutions. And Jennifer really, you know, we had dinner at the Perry Family Restaurant, that's why that's there. Um, and Jennifer really um, stuck to the script as far as, you know, any comments on the FERC decision, you know, we're not surprised, we're disappointed, but she really opened up about what the plant you know, if it does shut down and the school loses that money, what that means for her family, which um, means they, she will consider moving. She has a daughter that's about to graduate from Perry, but her son is um, in eighth grade and has learning disabilities, and right now Perry has a one-on-one -on -one counselor for every student like that, and that's just a luxury they'll not be able to continue to afford. Um, and I also <coughs> talked with kind of a long-time Perry Mayor Ed Klo, um, I went to school with his nephew, and they're kind of a longtime Perry family. Um, this day, actually, he he cut our meeting short, and he like jumped out of his office chair because he had gotten an email from someone in the Kasich administration, kind of accepting his request for a meeting, and he literally just told me like a oh, bye, and went and drove to tell Jerry in person, and. He was so excited, and it turns out that meeting never actually happened. It was with some underlings and not the governor himself, so it didn't happen. And while I was in Perry, this was probably my favorite part. I spent so much time in the Perry libraries going through like their archives of um, newspaper clippings and reports about you know, how the school was built and those decisions, um, because so much of the school had kind of, has kind of become folklore at this point in the town. Um, like, I think when I first pitched it to Seth, I told him that there, there was even a rumor that Frank Lloyd Wright himself designed it. Like, it was just this kind of mythical building of the school, so obviously not true, but the reality is that it, it was meant for like an Arizona climate, not a Cleveland climate. So, um, and kind of even, I learned so much about even when the plants first came to Perry, um, this, this article said North Perry learning to live wealthy and um, even how like some stuff that affected me when we were there which is like how our potassium iodine pills were distributed which I just thought 
was so warm. Like I thought everyone had potassium iodide pills in their caddy. Like no, that was just they always there. Um, so I really learned a lot about my, you know, my own the task I've spent most of my life in. And so you would think coming to MIT that this would have been kind of a given thesis topic for me. You know, really timely, really relevant. Um, you know, it's this kind of overarching dilemma America's facing right now, and also one that's you know, literally very close to home for me. And you could not be more wrong. I literally knew nothing about the, you know, nuclear power industry. I um, could not tell you the difference between, uh, you know, a boiling water reactor, a pressurized water reactor, which Perry was. Um, and I think that is in part in testament to kind of how quietly Perry has accepted the plan. Um, it's literally and metaphorically in the background of that town. It's, the school is really the point of pride. Um, but so this is kind of simple about my knowledge. I took a class this semester called Nuclear Power and Society, which by far um, was, has been the best decision I've made so far. It's really um, rooted kind of Perry's history for me in with the nuclear industry's um, history after World War II. And you know, I kind of got a broader sense of kind of this remarkable you know, confluence of events that really led Perry to become Perry, which, like, for example, the reason all of our nuclear power plants in the U.S. are um, cooled by water, they're called light water reactors, light water reactors, is not because that's, like, the safest or, like, most technically elegant design. It's, it's simply because during the Cold War, we wanted to, you know, compete with Russia's Navy, and so we kind of poured money into... Um, research into powering our submarines with nuclear power so you don't have to come back up to refuel so much. And so when it came time to like commercialize nuclear, we were just like, we know a lot about this kind, let's go with this. So it, it, really, um, it really showed me how really extraordinary my childhood was, which I had previously kind of thought was rather ordinary. Um, and in that realization, I really it started to set in how much really was at stake at Perry, um, and that kind of that exceptionalism that I was, you know, so privy to, it might not be around for the next generation, which was was a hard realization to confront because friends and classmates that have stayed in Perry are now have small kids, so it's really it feels unnatural to to realize that that you know the luxuries we were afforded will not be available for you know that. Kind of new generation, and I, and I think that's a you know a human nature problem. We don't, you know, we don't like to think about things we don't want to see happen. Um, we kind of close our eyes to them. And in the early days of reporting this story, I saw so much of that at Perry. One of my friends um, all went through all middle school and high school with her. And now as a two-year-old, her dad is a security guard at the plant. And when I told her. This was my thesis. She was like, why? They're never going to shut down the plants. And even when I was like bu buying the newspaper about um, the DC decision, I was kind of just asking the cashier, like, what's kind of been the mood around these decisions? And she said, you know, we're not too worried about it. And I get it, because I was right there with them. I didn't, you know, I, I really didn't want to think about what was going to happen, or that it would happen. Um, and I, I largely didn't until I went to a town where it had happened. And this is, um, so this meant that over IEP, I also rented a car for a couple weekends and drove just two hours from here, which is crazy short time, um, to Vernon, Vermont. And this is um, the Connecticut River. Some people are ice fishing on it. And this it looks like a modern art museum. It is actually the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant which was decommissioned, or which went off the grid December, <laughs> I had to put it to um, which went off the grid um, December 29th, 2014. And um, in going to Vernon, it was really remarkable how closely that this town's his, like, history mirrored Perry's. When the plant came, you know, it was mostly a farming community before this, and when the plant came, they built a new elementary school, a new library, some new parks, and they're just really proud of their town, and they really love the plant. Um, so when it, when this decision was made to um, take it off the grid, it was truly devastating to them. Um, one local councilwoman told me it was like losing their best friend. Um, 
So, and th that process kind of looks like this, is, which is um, a month after that decision, a month after the plant went off the grid, um, 300 of the workers were laid off, um, and most had to move away. Um, you know, they were making six figures plus benefits at this plant, and um, one ex-plant worker told me, you know, the Walmart and the kind of restaurants in the area weren't, you know, they weren't cutting it. Um, so they kind of saw a mass exodus of residents pretty immediately. Um, I'll skip this, the brass cooling. Um, and pretty immediately also, the plant, uh, or the town was thrown into some pretty difficult financial decisions. As soon as the plant goes off the grid, it's significantly devalued as its tax base, and they lost about 90% of their property tax value which meant that they twice increased their property taxes in, uh, in 2015. Um, uh, and you know, this, this is very, very highly contested. Everyone had a different opinion about this because it, it also meant that it lowered home values and made those workers who were trying to leave, it was harder for them to sell their homes. Um, and in the end, at the end of 2015, they still weren't able to make ends meet um, and they um, ended up cutting their entire police department. So Vernon, Vermont does not have a police department anymore. Um, this is kind of a note inside that wreath door that says, like, call the county sheriff. And I did, and no one answered or called me back, so that's worrisome. Um, but this is, this is really what's at stake in Perry, and it was um, kind of difficult to see. Because, and everyone I you know, talked to, who I told that I was doing this story because the plant in my hometown is shutting down, they all had, you know, the same advice, which is, you know, tell them to prepare themselves. Because, like, you don't want to think about it, but you must, because you're going to be thrown into these difficult decisions, and, you know, it's not pretty. And um, I, think, I think that is very much true. And um, I actually, when I went back to Perry, I told Superintendent Thompson, um, just that I had gone, I didn't start telling him that. Um, and he said, "Do I even want to know?" Like, I, like, and that kind of took me off guard because he, of all people, you know, for years has been thinking about. I mean, he's been staring down the face of, you know, the future of the school without the plans. And but I think just hearing about it happening to another town and truly what that's going to look like was going to be too much for him. Um, so a couple weeks after Vernon, I did end up back in um, Perry, as Seth said, in part because Brad from the Apple Store had deleted all my data. <laughs> um, but it worked out because it was also in part because of this, which is um, a rally that the town held to save the nuclear power plant, which this has, um, for outsiders, this rally seems really absurd, and I get it. Um, you know, my classmates included have kind of had their a hard time wrapping their head around like what is going on here, um, and people, you know, professors I've had here in the nuclear industry look at me like I have three heads when I tell them about this. They're like, what What are they hoping to accomplish here? And and it's a valid question. Obviously, there are you know bigger forces at play here, um, but I think this is why everyone's there, and this is in response to being prompted, raise your hand if the closure of this power plant will affect you. And nearly everyone in this room raised their hand. Um, and this really made me proud of Perry. Um, you know, nuclear isn't, uh, you know, the most sympathetic industry to save, but, you know, they've really rallied around the plant, um, kind of regardless of, you know, the, you know, kind of the divisiveness of nuclear power as a whole, they've kind of, you know, said, we see you, we see that your jobs are at stake and your livelihood and our school, and have really shown up in support of the plant. Um, the problem is, is that no one really knew whose side to be on. Um, Superintendent Thompson literally said those words to me, I don't know whose side to be on. Because First Energy is like, not a fan favorite in Ohio, it's not been the most morally conscious company. There's been some pretty nasty legal battles, um, you know, at the state level and in Perry kind of regarding taxes. And, you know, so people, you know, are, they don't, 
they don't want to save it for, for Saturday's sake, and, um, but no one's doing anything in Columbus, and so there's just a lot of panic, but you know, people are, people don't know who to blame, if anyone, and um, Governor Kasich definitely took the brunt of the anger in this, um, at this rally. And this is actually Jen Young, who is that mom who I talked about, um, and who I met with in January. Um, and I talked to plant executives after this rally. I talked to a couple plant workers who kind of stuck around to talk about organizing a bus trip to, like, um, renting buses to take to Columbus to protest. And that was kind of after the rally had wrapped up and I think kind of exemplifies the point that, you know, nothing that was said in this rally felt very hopeful or kind of a, like a tangent, uh, a rub, like a real solution to the problems that the town is facing. Um, and no one really, you know, got an answer for, you know, what what is Perry without the plants. Um, and that is something that they will, they are going to have to face. Um, about a month after this rally, First Energy verbally told the Nuclear Regis uh, Regulatory Commission that they were shutting, that they would decommission the Perry plant and two other plants they own. And three days later, they filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And about a month ago, they kind of um, sent in that like formal, formal letter that they would decommission the Perry Power Plants. So the plant is now scheduled to close um, in 2021, um, which has kind of left a bad taste in everyone's mouth that they like, kind of threatened the summer deadline originally and used like their jobs and the school as like political leverage. But nevertheless, less um, you know what seemed relatively uncertain when I started this um, started reporting this story is um, now looking more and more certain and um, Superintendent Thompson is true uh, really fielding a lot of that kind of panic and worry that's building up in the town he's had um, families call basically asking him whether they should move like is the school done with and he told me, I mean, what do you tell them? It's over. We move on. We had our day in the sun, and now the dance is over. It's over. And, you know, much to the advice of the Vernon people, Superintendent Thompson has been trying to kind of create a contingency plan for um, Perry. Since he got there in 2011, he's drafted what he calls like his compression plan, which is basically that they rent out the school and they kind of put all of the students in the old high school or like just the middle school um, and you know he said there's just one chink in that armor which is that this is a rural town it's 45 minute, 45 miles from Cleveland you know no one wants to go there um, which is kind of the dilemma that towns like Perry are facing which is that this is a great you know site for a nuclear power plant secluded and for safety reasons and kind of out of sight politically, but for towns that have come to rely on, you know, this as the sole source of their income, it's, you know, virtually irreplaceable. This is not something they can, this is not an industry they can, you know, um, bring back. And um, so, in and, and reporting the story, I saw, you know, people in the town kind of that, you know, the reality of this settling in more and more, but I, it also settled in kind of more and more for myself, which is that, you know, the town that really built me is the source of, you know, so much of my prosperity, um, it will, you know, cease to exist. And that's kind of, you know, conjured up some, you know, difficult um, emotional reactions from me um, that I've only been able to confront kind of obliquely, but um, just that, you know, I think I have a small part to play in this death, which is that, you know, the town built this school kind of as a monument and a gift to its citizenry, and then, you know, and people like me, oh, sorry, um, you know, got the best education that could possibly be afforded at, you know, zero cost. And um, then I graduated, went to college out of state, and didn't go back for eight years. Um, so that is um, an issue Perry's also dealing with. Um, so I, I, and just in conclusion, I guess if you or anyone you know has about three billion dollars, I would love to talk to them about a great investment opportunity. And I would 
obviously love to thank Seth for kind of talking me off that ledge when I lost all my data and my parents for when I got back on that ledge kind of every other week. So thank you both. That's it. two-part question. The first part is, um, can you tell us why nuclear yeah, power plants? I realized halfway. I realized I'm burning. I never said that. Or less, pro or less profitable. Yeah. Um, it's natural gas is killing it. Um, natural gas has kind of had this, like, a, almost against all energy experts, you know, opinion um, of two, nearly two-decade run of low natural gas prices. The the plants are super cheap to build, and then um, with horizontal drilling and fracking, it became really you know cheap to extract the gas to, and so they, it's just killing it. Wind and wind in particular is also kind of coming to its own, which is kill like that is another part of kind of the um, at least in the northeast region. That's All right. The second part of the question is is given the, the, the presence of capitalism. In uh, and, and, and our part of the world, and uh, the fact that uh, that we do think as a, as a society, uh, the force of capitalism uh, dictates that we do things that uh, that are the cheapest. Um, that does our what kind of responsibility? Because you painted a picture of a town that's in decline because of the removal of its main. Uh, industry does our society have an obligation to help such towns um, given the fact that the, the movement is completely according to the principles of capitalism yeah no I think that's the you know million dollar billion dollar question at hand and one that I've also kind of confronted on a personal level and um, you know there's not a real consensus in any industry right now about whether what to do about this um, you know you don't you know to kind of keep innovation going and to keep new technology and there's been really cool developments even in nuclear technology you you don't want to you know prop up stuff like coal and nuclear that you know make it then harder for new innovation to get on the grid later that will help us um, and so even within the nuclear industry there's not a real consensus about what to do about these plants and um, even you know as as personal as this story was to me and how difficult i have felt to um, you know report on these jobs and this livelihood and there's no there's no really backup plan here Coal, you know, coal has the Appalachian like restoration um, program, which has has it's like twenty five billion dollars to kind of soften the blow of the coal industry in like um, rural Appalachian towns, and there's that's there's none of that for nuclear, and so, but you know, everyone that I've talked to here, that's kind of been a relatively unbiased source. Of the research isn't being funded by. You know, Exelon and stuff um, has kind of said this. You know, you have to let these, you know, kind of drop off. So my thesis is a little bit push and pull in that in that regard. In that, you know, this is kind of a force of um, of capitalism, and um, we maybe it's more of our obligation to provide more of a safety net for these workers, like we did with coal, than to prop up entire industries which then render you know it really hard to innovate down the line. Yeah. Um, I think that there's also a thread that your thesis that you probably don't have to get into right now, but the idea of like which industries we see as American quote unquote and which industries we see as more failing out because you know capitalism doesn't happen without some amount of government intervention sometimes. Like I'm thinking like the automakers um, and even like the Appalachian Restoration Project. We we're more tendency to a uh, bail out of industries we see as very American. And I feel like there's always been kind of a hidden narrative, or maybe not so hidden, 
that we don't trust nuclear power as much. Um, probably thanks to the Simpsons in part, but uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know, I, I do you think that do you go into that new thesis about how since like Three Mile Island and since other kind of like the, the public has this sort of picture of nuclear and perhaps it might be misinformed and perhaps that's contributed to the lack of uh, you know desire to bail these out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because we don't think of nuclear as particularly American when in fact it really is the most American and no other country built this many nuclear power plants after World War II. Truly the US led the commercial nuclear power industry. And now and you know, it had it has a very storied history. That's not to, you know, say that that you know, it's been, you know, faultless in this. Um, but people don't trust it, and people, you know, there's still the issue of waste, and so, you know, a, when actually a carbon tax would save nuclear, liberals don't like nuclear, and now, you know, Republicans are kind of going with the cost, with like just to subsidize it, so there's no one in the middle to kind of, you know, the truth lies somewhere in that middle, and there's no one really to um, pull for nuclear. And, and even when I talked to Jen Young um, at that dinner, she said they just started doing like focus groups in Ohio about, because zero emissions is really what will save nuclear, carbon tax or anything. And they just started kind of doing focus groups and most people in Ohio thought natural gas was cleaner than nuclear power, emissions wise. And so they haven't done a good job of like marketing themselves as a, like, of clean energy that's not been their, you know, MO, and so, um, and they're just now starting to do that, and it's, you know, too late, so, yeah, I think that it's a great point, and, it, and it's actually moving overseas now, so whatever kind of innovation in the nuclear industry will happen, it won't be in America, which is kind of a deviation from the norm. All right, thank you so much. Uh, So, as I said, we are going to break for lunch. If uh, all of the members of their class and all of the faculty and instructors can gather right outside the room, we are going to go uh, very quickly as lunch is being set up and take our annual class photo. Um, and then we will reconvene here at around 1.15 uh, for the afternoon presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs>